Hello, so in this video I'm going to be talking about um, Eastern Roman military tactics uh, represented in the two treaties that I did um, a narration for. The first one is the Praecepta Militaria, uh, which was probably um, attributed to Nikiferos Phocas himself, um, the Eastern Roman Empire, who was succeeded by John Zimiskis. And then you have the uh, tactica of Nikiforos Uranos, who I believe was a general under Basil II. So this is very much during the resurgence of Eastern Roman power in the um, the 9th and 10th centuries. This is at the time where they are uh, conquering land back from uh, in Anatolia, in Cilicia, and in northern Syria. They're going on the offensive in uh, the Bulgaria and Basil II ends up uh, conquering the Bulgars and subjugating them and it's um, showing a specific type of warfare that was elicited by the Eastern Romans that by the um, 10th century or 11th century at least kind of doesn't necessarily die out but some parts become irrelevant and uh, as we'll get to it this is actually to do with the main uh, part of the tactics that are prescribed in the treatise which is the cataphracts. Now cataphracts are very heavily armoured um, horsemen. They are completely encased in various materials so that could be scale which is made out of iron, lamina, um, quilting possibly and uh, also hardened leather so hardened hide um, both the horse and the user itself covered completely from head to body and I think there's slits uh, between the legs on the sides to enable the horse to be able to go or maybe the the front and the rear um, and uh, the tactics of the time seem to be drawn into this optimization for cavalry so the the cataphracts die out um, in late antiquity as a usage um, mainly after I think the uh, Islamic conquests of the for the Arabs on from North Africa and uh, the Middle East um, and it kind of has a resurgence again in uh, the towards the middle of the medieval period so we're talking about well at least the end of the early medieval period so we're talking about the 800 to the thousand now um, this has this is a one trick pony excuse the pun and uh, the reason why and this is a disclaimer is because and it's also the reason why it dies out is because cataphracts as a unit are specifically specialized they're often very expensive and they require um, a set goal to accomplish um, and they're a, a, a purpose specific unit they are a one purpose thing and that that is mainly to break uh, enemy infantry formations or uh, anyway from my understanding and we'll, we'll actually talk about cataphracts and then we'll go into the main body of what exactly the the eastern roman army was doing at the time so the the cataphracts are would uh, come out of this giant square infantry formation um, which is housing the cavalry, which has all the baggage animals in and all the supplies, you know, all the arrows that might need to get replenished, where the injured are going to be. And uh, they come out either from the sides, depending on the treatise, or they might come out uh, from the front. And there's a, there's a debate on how that might be done. They might come out piecemeal uh, as part of some sort of groups and um, reconvene at the front. Or they might come out if they're going through the front as one solid unit. And it's a wedge, um, the main body of the shape. And I think it's 10 people at the front and it can be modified if there's less people. But you keep adding two horsemen to each side. Now the structure of the, the formation is quite interesting. Because inside the main body you have archers. And the main purpose of the archers is... As soon as the formation comes in range of the enemy, so arrow range, um, the Eastern Roman uh, cavalry in this unit who have 
archers are going to begin loosing their arrows at the enemy to um, disentangle the opponent. But the opponent's also firing or loosing arrows at the cataphracts to disentangle them as well. To so make sure that their coherency as a unit gets um, less and less as they go forward. And those people, from my understanding, are less armoured than the rest. Um, and uh, the main body, who aren't archers, are going to be mainly uh, equipped with maces. But they also all have sabres. But uh, maces or sabres, and also lances as well. And it's actually quite interesting because um, the depictions by Eric McGear, or the illustrations, have uh, alternate, alter, alternating... Um, weapons. So one person holds a spear or a lance and the person behind him and the person in front hold mazes as well. And uh, it's this very solid unit that needs to keep cohesion. We know that uh, charges were done in some circumstances, so full frontal charge, but they don't seem to have worked. And um, so the um, recommendation is that the um, unit keeps its nerves as calm as possible and goes at a trot and the Greek term seems to be a trot not a canter so a canter is kind of a, a more fast kind of a slow gallop but a trot is um, this kind of very I don't want to say casual walking but the equivalent of walking for horses so you have this unit of um, I'm not sure what the number is 400 to 500 in this giant wedge going forwards going forwards at a slow um, methodical pace and we have recommendations that it needs to be slow and methodical and cohesion needs to be kept but more importantly um, it's emphasized I think in the the tactica that the soldiers need to be courageous and brave and there's an implications for that right because um, both on the Eastern Roman and the Arab side for example the Hamdanids uh, they counter the they counter this by making reinforced and very thick infantry formations to counter this. And bearing in mind that the Eastern Roman cataphract unit, who's going forwards, is going to um, want to break through and maul that unit completely. And in cases or all cases, that cataphract unit is aimed at the general of the army, and especially in um, medieval armies and especially in the Eastern Roman case. Uh, the, the lead head figure of the army dying is going to be a morale plummet uh, for people and often those leaders can be the difference between the army um, staying alive so uh, coming in at moments and rallying the soldiers or fighting themselves or like the army completely retreating I think it's the battle of Manzica where um, rumors circulate or word circulates that uh, Romanos Diogenes dies and that causes a, a withdrawal of all the all the soldiers. Uh, it's not really a battle, the Battle of Manzika, but it's referred to as such. There isn't a lot of fighting that um, happens. But anyway, the so you um, you have this very heavily armored unit um, who, once they hit the formation at this trot, um, need to break this unit. Um, within the most optimum time possible and th that's either making them route which doesn't seem to be the recommendation though other people seem to make this point um, modern people like the history of Byzantium, Byzantium podcast when he talks to people uh, you know scholars who are um, talking about the military taxes of the Byzantines but the implication from Eric McGeer at least is that the the unit once it its contact needs to grind through the formation. And that's where the mace work comes in, right? And that's why these um, horsemen are completely clad in armor. They're like tanks, right? So a tank is a giant piece of metal it's, it's armor right and it has an engine and it has a giant gun now if you're going to pummel through infantry you need your heavily armored tank to be heavily armored so that bullets glance off of it so that some anti-tank rounds uh, don't penetrate through on it and you modify your tank based on its role right these are the creme de la creme of um, the most brave courageous and elite units 
who are just going to go forwards um, and make contact with the enemy formation. And the enemy have reinforced their formation to make it as thick as possible, right? So if they're making it as thick as possible, they're using sheer mass of manpower to stop this um, armored cavalry unit from getting through. Now that's really interesting, right? Because it ends up beco becoming a psychological show-off between two units. It becomes a, a case of who can break first, the, the armored cavalrymen, who, who is, even though they're heavily armored, it's extremely dangerous, right? They have to um, go through, be, even though they're extremely well protected, they have to go through this gap between their infantry formations and the enemies. Um, they have to, um, even though they're being escorted by two cavalry units on each side, so the flankers and I think the outflankers or whatever the terms are, um, they are risking being loose, having arrows shot at them. And then when they finally make contact with the enemy formation, um, they, they have these thick lines of spears and what might be pikemen who are waiting for them and are probably as scared as they are. Um, and they need to make contact and slam with that enemy, probably not at a very high momentum. Uh, but when they're going through, um, the, um, a lot of those people, it's, it's, a, it's a giant thick wall of spears and pikes. And um, they have to maneuver the way through or brute force their way through, you know, striking people with their maces and being as brutal as possible, basically. And um, the, even though their horse is heavily armored, usually, according to Eric McGear at least, uh, if, if, if your horse um, gets killed, you're likely going to go down with your horse and get killed as well. Or, um, you know, the, the sheer collapse and then you have other horsemen riding on top of you or people walking on top of you. And, you know, there's a suffocating element, especially when you're in such heavy armor. Uh, means that it's extremely dangerous for both sides but it seems that um, Eastern Roman tactics revolve around this one tactic in order or this one um, I don't want to call it a Hail Mary or a saving grace because it's not a, it's not a last resort but this one specific thing that acts as a giant battering ram to go through and it, it might be aiming for the enemy person it might be aiming for the enemy infantry formation itself and it's one massive grind you're just you're there with the mace um and you're you know striking at people and causing as much mayhem and carnage as possible and we have psychological tools that are used um though whether they were perceived as psychological tools at the time is another matter entirely i could be wrong about that actually but um it talks about um praying and going in dead silence saying a prayer in unison and uh, dead silence and then saying it a second time and the the, the reason for that is um, to get everybody calm and coordinated for this one strike when you're going to go and strike this formation because you don't want the main elite body of troops that are performing this singular role to be panicking right you want them to be able to um, have the calmness to go in and essentially grind the enemy formation down or aim for the enemy's leader and um, that requires a lot of um, coherent psychological calmness that doesn't give way to emotions um, so uh, the the main body of Eastern Roman tactics at the time revolves around that it is very context specific um, and it revolves around that one role but the eastern roman army at the time is mainly geared towards supporting cavalry and the the cavalry um or the the whole army is arranged as a giant square formation and now there's several reasons why this develops um, and it kind of still continues um, onwards to the time of the Crusades. I think the Crusaders use this formation as well, some sort of a square in which the cavalry can come in and rally um, and it also creates good fallbacks. The also the good advantage of it is um, you can't be surrounded if everybody's in a giant square formation. 
Um, and this is the case with uh, Bedouin tribes. Um, so uh, Bedouin tribes are used and their um, speciality is raiding and also going behind the enemy and ambushing, say, the baggage train. Well, if you have a giant square, you negate that, right? And the treatise makes the treatises possibly makes it very clear that the um, the Bedouins are not to be pursued. One because they have Arabic horses, which um, are quite fast, and a lot, and the breeds are a lot more faster than the Eastern Roman horses. Um, but also, um, it, it's just a, a precarious affair where um, it's just not a situation where people will win. Um, so you have this giant square, there's um, different amounts of units and different intervals um, within each side depending on how big it is or what you want to do. Uh, you have repositioning of men to reinforce infantry formations and make them thicker. And I think it might not necessarily be reinforced, but it's done for example by um, taking men on the outside of the formation and putting them in the rear to reinforce them. And the, the, the purpose of that is very similar because the Hamdanids were using similar tactics to the Eastern Romans at the time. They were using heavily armoured cavalry that would try and smash through a formation and then you have this psychological standoff of who can last the most. And even with the infantry as well, the infantry are going to be somewhat heavily armoured as well. Um, which leads to this kind of, um, not brute force, but heavy armour versus heavy armour infantry, who's going to break the first. Uh, and then um, the ones who break first are going to get slaughtered by the cavalry who come in. Now, it's important to understand that, um, and we get indications of this from the treatises anyway, that uh, the infantry wouldn't always be um, traveling heavy in armor. The uh, treatises make recommendations to go, to set up camp where water is, and camp is going to be important as we go along. And that uh, um, they carry, they have mules or donkeys or whatever or horses. I think it's mules to carry their armor for them. And if anybody uh, is too fatigued, to also go on the mules as well as the formations going. However, the um, going back to the main point, um, and this is sorry, and just as a diversion, this is also applied to cataphracts, right? Um, so, uh, when cataphracts need to pursue the enemy, or they're kind of no longer needed, they can put their armor to the side and go with the other main body of units to pursue uh, fleeing units in some cases, or at specific units at least. Um, so it tells you that the soldiers weren't always wearing armor all the time. They would be carrying their shield, and that might be, um, it's assumed anyway, it might be strapped around the back, uh, but also it might be um, strapped on the spear as well being carried. So the, the basis of the formation seems to be developed out of a link to um, how camps were fortified by the Eastern Romans. So the Eastern Romans have a very set way that camps are fortified. And depending on if they're on the move, um, they might not dig trenches. Um, it might just be a waste of time to do so. However, it, if you imagine a square, and then you have the lines coming down, and then the, <laughs> the parallel lines going across as well, and it makes this kind of um, inward square within this giant square as well. And that's mainly how the the main body of the formation goes. And it's from these uh, tactics where you get, uh, for example, the, the main uh, point of reference is the Siloge Tacticorum, which is an earlier treatise, but it's highly academic in the way it talks about stuff, it gives specific measurements, um, and it's almost seen as an academic exercise for um, people writing this stuff, but the the Praecepta Militaria and the Tactica of Nikiforos Uranos are more practical. And they take details and then they admit details as well. Um, but it seems to be geared towards um, this encampment or the camp structure of Eastern Roman armies. And it's basically a giant mobile military camp that's moving forwards. Um, now, within this we have uh, several uh, key elements. The first one is what I call the Menavladi. 
So the Manavladi are the bravest and most courageous soldiers. Uh, originally they were not interspersed with the infantry itself, but we get their indications that by at least the Nikiforos' Uranos' time, they're interspersed with the infantry. Um, so that they're not separate to the infantry formation as much. Um, and they hold these one piece, um, large, thick spears. And uh, their objective is to go out in the front when the heavy cavalry comes and engage them, essentially, embrace. Now, Eric McGear has, uh, and he, I think he has collaborate, collaborated with other people talking about it, has a theory that um, they brace it on the floor like um, spikes, basically. And um, that would give people in the back who have spears the opportunity to engage the enemy as well. So it's almost like, you know how uh, lines of musket will kneel and then the one above will fire and they both fire at the same time? It's creating different fields of spears that can um, engage. So you have a wall of spears, basically. But the Manavladi are specifically referenced as having one thick um, spear that can engage. Um, now, it, the, the treatise itself says that if you don't have thick spears and you have to make them out of two pieces, make sure that they're two pieces, but make them sure, make sure it's that it's as thick as can be held. Um, and the, the simple purpose of this was that it was there to support the infantry in um, dispersing these heavy cavalry who were going to come and try to break the formation as well. And that also coincides with the infantry formation being reinforced in depth. Like I said, so people on the sides um, of the formation will come and work their way to the back and reinforce it thickly. Now, um, it's there's indications that originally the Manavladi would move out right um, a distance away from the formation. But that's dangerous, right? Because they can be surrounded by... Uh, cavalry, they can be surrounded in general and just um, destroyed. So the, there seems to be implications later on that they're kept nearer to the infantry formation. And um, it, it's, it's important as a caveat to show that this is an ongoing process. It's not something that develops at one specific time and optimizes at one specific time, but through the ages it becomes more and more defined and more and more refined to make it perfect or make it as optimal as possible. Now, you have the spearmen who are in this square uh, going to be heavily armoured. Um, and then behind them, you're going to have bowmen um, who are going to be showering the, the enemy with arrows. Um, and they're going to be doing something similar to counter the heavy um, cavalry formations, which is they're going to be trying to disperse them with arrows. No, it, it's not the, the, the importance of the arrows uh, in terms of killing the enemy. If it happens, it's great. Um, if it doesn't, then that's not really the point. The point is that it's trying to cause as much chaos. It's trying to cause the uh, cavalry to either hit the horses and disorientate them or to get somebody to raise their shield on horseback and take cover and um, and basically cause as much mischief as possible before the cavalry formation breaks into the or collides with the um, infantry, the front infantry rank. Now behind those as well you have the heavy infantrymen and um, it's called a double ribbed uh, formation, I think, is the term that's used. And the, the basis of this double rib formation, I think, is mainly a uh, both a logistical, so an organizational, it has an organizational purpose, but also it has a uh, morale purpose. So with the organizational purpose, it enables the um, the uh, formation to be reinforced properly and it also means that if there are people coming from behind within a or that somehow the square has been breached you can fight on both sides but the, the genius thing about a square is that there's nowhere to run to as well so the, the square formation um, not to digress enables a good morale booster to show that there is no fallback line
the only rallying point is the square itself um, and that's also for the for the uh, back row of spears within each um, formation of infantry and the, the the main point is kind of saying that everyone's together and that back line is almost trying to keep the, the front ranks fighting all the time now it's it's quite an ingenious way of uh, dealing with things right because it, it enables you essentially to keep track of you have a very centralized location enables uh, you to keep track of all your men at once um you uh, it enables you to uh, create a situation similarly to how ships are in, an, in a modern navy whereby or any naval engagement whereby you can't retreat anywhere because you're surrounded by ocean where are you going to retreat to um, you have lifeboats and that's kind of about it right um, so it, it enables you to fight more fiercely because you know there's kind of no going back with a, a, with an army breaking um, and routing and it's just a very efficient way to ca combat this heavy cavalry, right? Now, between these intervals, we have a light at infantry. Uh, before I begin, before I start with that, uh, the amount of arrows um, per person is, I think, forty. Uh, it's about fifty arrows per uh, archer in their quiver, and then that can be reinforced from the baggage trains, which have an additional. Um, 50 arrows or I think the the archers hold 40 to 60 arrows and there's an additional 50 from the imperial um, stockpile uh, uh, in the in the square itself and you have people um, who would be the non-combatants essentially who would uh, go and collect the arrows and give them to people who need it so that the archers themselves don't have to go back and uh, collect these arrows and you also have it for water as well um, so uh, you have people who would go and essentially refill canteens for people who are low on uh, water and it, it's important to emphasize that in the the hot um, Anatolian heat and also in the in the Balkans as well like having a water source is very valuable and uh, not being heavily armored when you're moving is very valuable as well because um, you know uh, sweat might rust the armor itself and it's just weighing you down entirely so it's more probable that when armies were marching they were relatively unarmored and then towards the engagement they formed rank and then they armored up um, which is a, a lot more of an intelligent way to uh, conduct the battle itself so you have these light infantry and um, they have uh, bows so you have heavily armored archers and then you have um, uh, less heavily armored archers and they are in the intervals between these formations um, and they are from my understanding anyway and I could be completely wrong about this um, they are there to prevent uh, any units coming in to the, to the square formation but uh, interestingly enough they are there also to support the um, cavalry as well and I believe this is like a, a tactic stretching back to Alexander the Great at the Battle of Galgamela. If you see the film Alexander, this is kind of the case where Alexander the Great's um, using a ruse essentially to get the enemy cavalry to shadow him and then he turns and then he moves into like a formation or something and charges in. And the people behind him are skirmishers. And they, they skirmish and try to uh, break the enemy cavalry by harassing them. Now, um, that's the film. I don't know if the Battle of Galgam... Apparently, it's a very accurate uh, to the source material. It's one of the most accurate films in the, historically. But it's also very tedious and boring in some cases. That's what the criticism says. Um, so, the, these light skirmishers who are javeliners and bowmen, essentially are moving out of the formation when there's cavalry engagements and um, harassing cavalry, the enemy's cavalry in support of their own as well, which is quite interesting. Because if you've ever played a strategy video game, you will see that um, bowmen or any skirmish unit, whether it's Total War or Age of Empires, is weak against cavalry, but that's not the case actually. Um, and you know, I used to play Total Wars, and I, you know, I've used this strategy before on that video game, and it works more or less. So that's kind of the light 
uh, infantry out of the way. It's also really important to emphasize that it's recommended that no matter who you are dismounted, everybody carries slings, like slingers. Um, so slingers were still being used up until this period. And, you know, at a, slings at a high velocity when swung can create a very um, high momentum piece of mass or object that hits into somebody. And it might not hurt, them. it might not go through them and kill them, but it's going to hurt. And imagine just the hail of those coming through. So it has some indications that the average person or soldier knew how to use a sling as well. And, you know, all dismounted infantry would be equipped with them. Now, if we get onto the cavalry that aren't cataphracts, um, you have what are called the procus procusatores. They have other names as well, like the, uh, I think I'm going to bastardize this, the trabezi or trabezesti or something or the khusari khusarasi or something which is actually uh, where the etymological term of hussar might derive from and these people are usually made up of people on the borderlands um, so Romans, Armenians uh, light infantry and their objective is to go out and harass the enemy and these units aren't particularly big. Within these units, you have about 50 mounted bowmen. And um, their objective is to um, entice the enemy to pursue and engage. And if if so, the, um, or if the enemy doesn't engage, they are to disengage and come back into the formation as well. Um, this is usually, there are several, there are two units usually, they're, they're in low numbers, but they're skirmishers essentially. And now coinciding with that, you have uh, the outflankers on each side. Now, um, they're different terms, so one of them is the outflankers, the other one, I think the term, I can't remember what it is, is, um, is the implication is that they're receiving, so they're there to counter outflankers, but one is on one side and one is on the other. And it's quite interesting that um, if you have these units who are outflanking and it's mainly going to be um, who are procusatores, so they're skirmishers and they're outflanking on the right, um, even though that they're shooting um, or they're harassing, um, they're in a disadvantageous position because they're shooting at the side which is holding a shield. And also these people, if they're shooting back, um, you know they can only shoot from one side they can't really shoot from the other so you know there's a certain amount of disadvantages that come with that but these um these cavalry units from my understanding engage and also um there's a number of them there's like um three or four from each side i might be wrong about that but we have specific recommendations when the enemy army flees that these formations are to, or two or three uh, units, are to engage. And if there's a full route, uh, all the enemy engages, the cataphracts take off their armor, and then the infantry trail behind. Uh, but in situations where that's not the case, you would have people guarding the baggage train. Um, you would have only set units going out and engaging. Now, um, in some situations, the, the, the leader, the Stadigos, or the emperor himself, might go and engage with his units. There are certain situations where this is escalated that might be the case. So, for example, the um, you've sent several units of cavalry to engage their cavalry, and now it's escalating to an extent where you need to send supporting units in. Um, in that case, you might send your own cavalry units or you might go and engage yourself. So, I mean, the tactics are quite sophisticated in technicality, but they're relatively simple. It's, it's just a giant square formation where cavalry can move in and flank as well. Um, and then you have this elite uh, one-trick pony cataphract unit, which is there to break the enemy formation and also aim at the leader as well. Um, and there's different pieces of advice in these treatises as well. Precautions, scouting, uh, making sure that you have spies in uh, the enemy land and making sure that um, they can lie properly 
it doesn't go into too much detail it just says make sure to announce that you're going somewhere and then go the other way or when nobody's paying attention just go on your way and go to where you need to go it talks about uh, making sure um, the passes when you're falling back essentially from campaign are occupied by infantry because in Anatolia and the Balkans there are a lot of passes and for example the Bulgars take advantage of that by building palisades in these uh, passes essentially and some um, Eastern Roman generals make the mistake of not um, garrisoning infantry in these passes when they're uh, retreating or when they're on campaign and essentially the enemy can ambush them um, it talks about setting up opportunities to ambush as well um, and, and being very shrewd about it um, a lot of this stuff is geared towards uh, Anatolia and northern Syria um, and not necessarily the Balkans. The Balkans is a very heavily uh, forested areas, at least it was at the time, and somewhat mountainous areas as well. And it's even testified that Nikiforos uh, Phokas, who himself was a, a great general, uh, was even apprehensive himself about going into these places. So in, in these places, um, it's, it's going to be more the case that you're using infantry and not necessarily a lot of cavalry, and especially not cataphracts as well. Um, but it, as a caveat in these situations as well, you have things like ruses. So for example, I can't remember which battle it is. Um, it's against maybe the Pechenegs or a Patzinax, as uh, the source material says. And basically Hungarians, um, or Bulgars, the, um, the, the, the uh, Eastern Romy army is surrounded, it is outnumbered, and the general in question um, decides to play deceptive games. And the treatises actually talk about um, disorientating the enemy and creating ruses in order to uh, harass them and lower them morale, and then finally to deal the decisive blow with a battle when it is known that there is a beyond reasonable doubt that the you're going to win against the enemy so this is what he does he refuses to engage the enemy um the enemy think that uh the eastern romans are cowards so they uh get drunk they go uh, they stay in camp they become very merry and then what he does is he uh sends cavalry to engage um the the I think it's the next day or another another time uh, the enemy come and try to engage and then he leads them into an ambush essentially and uh, annihilates them and he, uh, but when the the cavalry come uh, I think from the chase that the, the implication at least is from the ch uh, chase that they're too tired to engage um, so they all get slaughtered basically to the man. And that's kind of the point, right? The, you, when you go into military engagements, you don't want to rush to a pitch battle. You want to harass, and especially if you're outnumbered, you don't want to rush into an engagement where you're going to be surrounded and completely uh, destroyed, right? Um, you want, or you don't want to be, it doesn't need to be a brute um, force affair. You need to uh, weaken the enemy as much as possible so that when you fight on the battlefield, you're going to be able to... Uh, triumph without having to do the extra leg work in order to do so and that's fascinating right um, it, it means that um, the type of tactics used by the Eastern Romans were extremely sophisticated they took into account many considerations it wasn't this a stereotype of a simple mano to mano engagement of in, of um, formations clashing and you kind of get that in western europe as well with the late medieval period you most um engagements of skirmishing uh battles are usually large affairs even in for example places where you can pay people in coin like northern italy um even then like people aren't necessarily used to large engagements especially towards the renaissance and in the renaissance as well um, so a lot of it is small scale and um, talks about raiding essentially and also logistics is a big uh, thing and destroying logistics because some of the recommendations or at least the recommendation is to destroy farmland around when you're sieging 
uh, a place, uh, making sure that nobody's coming in to supply the place, uh, making sure that there's no opportunity for these people to be fed, incentivizing them that you'll give them gifts if they let go of the fortress that they're holding, um, threatening that if there are any, for example, Armenians in the fort who are assisting, they're going to be executed. And this is a psychological tool as much as it's a physical one because it's creating dissent within the fortress itself. And by creating dissent, you can kind of um, uh, take the location a lot easier, right? Um, so even then, it's like, you know, there's a lot of considerations that need to be taken into account. There's a lot of considerations that are quite complicated that I don't think we necessarily take into account. And I think it's also because modern depictions of sieges in video games or movies are very simplified you video games are incredibly difficult in trying to articulate accurate and uh, time dependent so they're contingent on a, a specific time period the types of battles that are going on the types of formations what options to take what you need to do and um, what tactics you need to do um, and because of that we get this understanding that battles are simple affairs and they're, they're really not, right? Um, especially with films as well, it's difficult to depict how complicated tactics could be. And I mean, you see that in uh, even depictions about modern combat as well. Like uh, Battle Los Angeles, which is not a recent film anymore, um, but uh, Call of Duty, you know, Modern Warfare these don't show um, accurate um, tactics right because they they're, they're theatrical they need to show um, some sort of uh, thing to entertain you whereas games like armor might um, show accurate battle tactics now that's no different in the past right um, especially these Romans who had a specific system of being able to deal with this um, so that's me um, talking for more than 40 minutes. Um, that's everything I kind of have to say on the matter. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this video and I hope it's been educational and I hope it clarifies bits about uh, the Eastern Roman army and kind of how it was situated. I'll end this with uh, another caveat. So um, towards the 11th century, the, the heavy cavalrymen in the Eastern Roman army as we'd see them in cataphracts and I've already said this in the video but it kind of dies out and it dies out because um, as territory is occupied and the requirements change to uh, they're no longer fighting the same armies that the Hamdanids who the Hamdanids are the Fatimids and they're there to keep the status quo geopolitically uh, the times change and because of that the, the cataphracts decrease and also in the Balkans there isn't a lot of um, use for these types of cavalrymen either and I've already made that point but I'm making it again um, and so you know you're gonna have detachments near the border who are going to rush in situations where they're going to be uh, needed to keep the status quo um, before you know if, if war does break out before the main Tagmata army who's almost like an insurgent force as well, can move towards the border in order to um, engage in battle. Um, so we kind of, and it's important to emphasize this because whenever we think of the quote unquote Byzantine or Eastern Roman army, um, we think of the cataphract as a unique unit. In Age of Empires II, the cataphract is a unique heavy uh, cavalry unit for the Eastern Romans as well. Um, uh, it's a, it's a um, unique unit in the Total War games, right? But the the time period of the Cataphracts is very specific, very purpose specific, and is very expensive to maintain. And that's important, right? Because it shows that there weren't Cataphracts all the time. The, the Romans, according to Eric McGear, seem to have experimented with uh, the cataphracts at multiple times to make them work and sometimes it optimizes and works and sometimes it doesn't so it's not a long continuous drawn out thing that has a lineage it's a specific battlefield um, role that 
uh, that is used in a certain way uh, for a singular purpose. Um, and that's the case with modern equipment, right? In, in a case where bullets no longer become apparent or they no longer work, so we've somehow designed armor like in the Dune series with shield generators to um, protect us from bullets and small arms, the, the, the age of the rifle or the sniper is going to denigrate and we're going to have to go back to using close combat weapons. But in the, in the chance where that isn't the case, or that the, the shields diminish in some way through time, we'll go back to using something similar to assault rifles in a similar context, but might be different entirely as technology develops to different circumstances. Not saying that it's a linear process, but uh, it adapts based on the circumstances. It's not static. Um, but that's kind of one of the myths of the Eastern Roman army is the cataphract. The cataphract wasn't used um, as widespread as people make it out to be and had a specific purpose in mind which was to grind down infantry formations and make them rout and aim for enemy leaders by going through that infantry formation. But anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope it's been educational and thank you very much.